You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear a woman booking a room for a party at a community centre. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties. The woman's first name is Maria. So Maria has been written in the space. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties. Yes, we do. We vary our sized accommodation. It depends on what you're looking for, really. We're looking to hold a party, a children's birthday party, and we need a room that will hold about seventy people, with space for a small disco area, games, dancing, and food. Well, we have a large room, and it would certainly hold at least a hundred people comfortably. It's used a lot for parties and things like that. That sounds as if it might be suitable. I've tried various venues, and they're either booked up or they don't hold enough people. Can you tell me when you were thinking of holding the party? I know it's short notice, but we wanted to hold it Saturday week. That's September fifteenth. Let's have a look.、Uh, hmm. Yes, you're in luck. The Mandela Suite is free then. I'll just write that down. M A N D E L A. And the time. When were you thinking of holding it? In the afternoon, from three thirty p.m. to nine p.m. Yes. Okay. There is no smoking on the premises. And we're only licensed to have soft drinks.、Oh, that's okay. I think I'm happy to go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Can you just give your postcode? Yes, it's P A five seven G J. Fine. And the flat and street number? It's flat number forty, and the street number is thirty-five. Okay, so that's flat forty, thirty-five Beaches Street. Yes, that's right. And a contact number? 
My landline is 223279 with the code. But I'll give you my mobile number, which is 07897293381. Okay, 293381. Um, can you tell me how much it will cost? It's quite reasonable, actually. It's £115 for the hire of the room, with tables and chairs. But if you want to hire disco equipment, we've got a basic system with speakers and other equipment for £25. But there is no technician around in case anything goes wrong. And, of course, it's optional. Oh, that would save us carting something from home, but maybe we should bring a spare sound system just in case. We've never had any problem with the system, but you might not want to take any chances. What about catering? Well, we had thought of getting everyone bringing something. We have someone who can do catering for £9 a head, including the cake, if required. That's handy, but it's a lot, as we have a fairly tight budget. So, you want to go ahead with the booking? Yes, certainly. OK. I need to take a deposit of £30, which is refundable. The balance needs to be paid two days before the event at the latest. Fine. You can cancel up to two days before, but after that you lose the deposit. We don't intend to cancel, but is there any insurance we can take out? Yes, there's a, a form here somewhere. How much? It's, uh, oh, let me see. It's only £9 for the 24-hour period, and that covers you for cancellation, damage and injury. Well... At least we'd better have a look at it. How would you like to pay the deposit? Cash. I'll just give you a receipt. Uh, there you are. Ten, twenty, thirty. Thirty pounds. Uh, Maria Lincoln. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really glad I found somewhere. We have been trying to book a place for the past two weeks, so thank you again and uh, bye for now. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hello. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm -hmm. But of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. 
obviously there are more bus stops, uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. <sighs> you will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day and then around London when I'm here. Mm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. <sighs> of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then? Right, well, you can choose. Uh, we're here at the information office, OK? Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop, opposite the bank. Uh -huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages. Uh. If you want to take the train, walk down the High Street towards the city. Go past the bank, and on your left is the station, mm -hmm. just before you get to the post office. Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there. Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first. <sighs> to get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the High Street. Then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right opposite the cinema. Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi. <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question, and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average, I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock. It's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it and will just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant. 
or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there, and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste 
is going to become an energy source, for example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has any... That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Start again. It's a red stick.